Welcome, everyone. Hello, everyone. Um, <clears throat> let's get started. Um, welcome, everyone, to AUD tonight for what I know will be an extraordinary lecture by two architects who are surely among the most talented designers and design thinkers of their generation. Nanako Umamoto and Jesse Reiser, welcome to UCLA. Let me also add a vicarious welcome to the third leg of the RUR triad, Deborah Reiser, an incredible architect and remarkable figure in her own right, who while, made, uh, who, while, who while not here tonight, sorry about that, in person is certainly present in spirit, as we'll soon see. Jesse Nanako, you must know how delighted I am to introduce you tonight Two people in our discipline I care so very much about, speaking at the school I care most about. And so let me thank Heather for bringing them here and giving me this opportunity to say a few words about Nanako and Jesse before they begin. Uh, let me first say that I have the advantage tonight of having seen an abbreviated version of this talk two weeks ago across town. Uh, Jesse promised at that time a more extended edition for us here, and I'm eager to hear it, especially now with Nanako in the house. Uh, I'm especially looking forward to having this second opportunity to absorb further the implications of a central theme that ran through Jesse's talk two weeks ago, a central theme in their work and thinking, that of the genealogy. Without giving anything away, I think we'll see tonight the way the individual genealogies of three architects, Nanako, Jesse, and Deborah, come together to create RUR architecture, two risers flanking an Umamoto in the middle. The work of this triad is, in some sense, the confluence of their three genealogies, a Venn diagram of sorts in which the overlapping center forms the unique cosmos of RUR. Each expression of work that emanates from this cosmos and I use this term intentionally here for its Quintarian flavoring, um, strikes me like signals from a pulsar. I know that it's a bit rich, but um, powerful, certain, previously unseen, and carrying always a certain measure of mystery. For all of the years I have studied their work, I still feel the enigmatic undertones that drew me to it in the first place. However, clarifying their presentation tonight may be the deep interior of their cosmos remains just beyond reach, or at least it seems that way to me, a reservoir of expressive force that is seemingly inexhaustible. How do they move from one project to the next, each its own expression, yet tied in some strange way to the others? I don't know. What I do know is that it is this movement itself that is somehow key to understanding what it is they are up to. About a year ago, Jesse sent me an essay to read, apropos of nothing and without any explanation, by Harold Bloom on Ralph Waldo Emerson. In it, Bloom dismisses common readings of Emerson as, transcend, uh, as transcendentalist and to instead focus on his ever-present insistence upon intellectual and conceptual movement from one thing to the next, that the space of transition is the place to be. Bloom quotes Emerson, so I will too. Power ceases in the instant of repose. It resides instead in the moment of transition from a past to a new state, in the shooting of a gulf, in the darting to an aim. Maybe Jesse wanted to remind me of this, I don't know, but it seems here a useful premise to have in mind as we hear and see a lecture about projects past and present and the connections between them. Don't get me wrong, for my focus here on movements between projects, as each project itself is, of course, worth careful study in its own right, each a real and stable construct in the world. Achingly real, in fact, is this work, even the unbuilt projects. A contradiction, perhaps, this concurrent presence of both transition and end, movement and stoppage. But if so, Jesse and Nanako, like Emerson, are not bothered by self-contradiction, since they know they contain endless multitudes. As Emerson said on this note, or on this point, a foolish consistency 
is the hobgoblin of little minds. With that, please welcome Nanako Umamoto and Jesse Reiser. Well, we're delighted to be here. Um, and Jason you know, couldn't have made a better introduction. Um, I hope it, we can live up to your introduction. Um, tonight uh, is sort of a hybrid talk between um, the issues that really interested us in the book and then two projects that are well along in construction uh, in Taiwan. And of course, there are overlaps uh, both formally and conceptually. But um, yeah, I hope, you know, through the kind of development of the talk, we'll sort of get the gist, the, the direction of the work. So this is the Taipei Pop Music Center main hall. Um, drone shot as of about three weeks ago. It's a project that uh, you know, was in gestation for 10 years, even prior uh, to the competition being uh, you know, handed out. And it's been uh, almost 10 years since we uh, you know, won this competition. So much of the work you know, that, we're, that we're showing um, kind of keys into that in various ways. The book, uh, was really, we struggled with that almost for the same amount of time in two, since 2006 and various permutations of it. Um, but uh, we found uh, a structure finally um, in a film, a famous film I'm sure you all know, Citizen Kane by Orson Welles, where there's a very interesting way of, you know, kind of staging uh, both. Um, uh, you know, kind of linear development over time, but also a kind of circuitous returning uh, back, these ellipses that uh, could tie material, uh, you know, from the future to the past and back again. And so um, that served as a kind of rough structure for the way we thought about um, the book. The other thing was, um, just the heterogeneous, you know, material, the projects that we work on, um, you know, finding a place for this cabinet of uh, wonder, cabinet of curiosity. Uh, and so the book is also shot through with more or less incidental material, um, not entirely tied to the kind of linear development. Uh, so, um, overall, though, we are looking uh, both kind of projectively and retrospectively at um, overall projects in the office. The first thing, of course, is not a project, but it was a problem, a problem um, posed by uh, our uh, mentor, John Hayda, and it took 35 years basically to figure it out. But the others are, you know, more tied to, uh, you know, you know sustained set of investigations. So this is one of the kind of overall genealogical structure uh, of our of of R U R and the influences. Uh, Deborah Reiser, kind of top center. Then there's the Japanese uh, side uh, in Nanako's education prior to Cooper Union. Um, and then, of course, it's probably a fair, fairly familiar uh, grouping of uh, you know, uh, architects uh, on the right. And then also very important, I think, for our generation, and especially on the East Coast, but I think here too, having an enormous influence, uh, you know, figures like Jeff Chipnick and, and Sanford Spinker and others. Uh, and I think that's also somewhat unique I think of this period. Of course, Sylvia Laban would also be, you know, a very prominent figure in that constellation as well. But more immediately uh, around the family, uh, Edward Klausner, who was um, 
uh, my maternal grandfather was a structural engineer and he worked very closely with those two architects on the right, George Nemeny and Abraham Geller, both of whom were Breuer disciples. Um, uh, George also was um, one of the main sort of uh, assistants to Van Allen on the Chrysler building. So they both went to Cornell. They were young Hungarian immigrants, both Jewish. Um, going up against an, uh, a school which at that time was much more conservative. Um, they were almost thrown out for doing modern architecture and then connected to um, Breuer, worked for Breuer, and then went off on their own. So um, my grandfather did most of the structural engineering uh, for those two architects and basically you know, kind of brought my mother in to that office. To, to the Nemini office, a very small office. This was uh, the bane of my mother's existence. This was her professor, uh, one of the professors at Pratt, uh, really, William Brager, who was a kind of gropious functionalist, very young uh, kind of architect out of Harvard, pushing a very hardcore functionalism. You find, actually, if you see the, the recent book by Harry Cobb, he ran into a similar sort of uh, problem with the Gropius regime at Harvard. Uh, and so my mother was one of two women um, in the office, uh, actually at Pratt, uh, 70 men, two women, most of whom were on the GI Bill, had, were veterans. Um, so they had seen a lot. They um, saw Willie Brager and they wanted to literally kill him. They were, they were talking about throwing him out the window and the dean had to stop it. So this is what deans, you know, do. Um, in my mother's final year, she, uh, there was a one-time semester uh, gig by you know, a well-known character, Philip Johnson, and Philip Johnson taught a class on Mies Wright and Corbusier. The students did pavilions a la those still alive masters. So Johnson um, was, you know, of course, on kind of personal terms with those characters. They were still alive. And so much of the class, I mean, aside from introducing, you know, um, history, aesthetics, and form, which was anathema you know, in the Gropius uh, pedagogy, um, kind of brought uh, an immediate vitality. So despite the nefarious history of Johnson, which we all know, my mother still considers him her savior. Um, you know, that he got her out of the Gropius, I don't know, functionalist nightmare, according to her. So this was her in the office with, I mean, it was a very small office they did you know, um, very unique uh, houses. There's a guy at the center, Richard Henderson, who was actually also our professor at Cooper Union, a very talented designer, and George Nemini on the far right, I think he's wearing like an artiste who has a star. But the three of them really worked closely together for about 15 years. And Richard Henderson was also the person behind the glass house, did the detailing of the glass house. So he was like a secret weapon in that period. Um, that led to a genealogy of work in the mid-50s, starting with more Breuer kind of derived work, kind of grid-based, and they, you see a slow progression into a more volumetric treatment uh, you know, of the buildings, the vertical wood siding and so forth which ultimately results in the, uh, you know, the famous Guathme House. The history, of course, is, you know, that Charlie, it was Charlie Guathme's first project, but really it was uh, entirely Richard Henderson. It was done on the lunch hour. Guathme was still an intern in the office. So this is a history that's been somewhat suppressed, and I thought it was important to kind of bring it out. And you can see you know, clearly the genealogy, uh, you know, the development towards that house. Uh, and then after um, 
Guafni and his first partner Henderson left the office, my mother continued. She did this uh, kind of wall house project, which didn't get filled. And, uh, you know, I showed this. It was, it's still not clear which one came first, but I think it was in the air. This is John Haydock's wall house. Um, also interesting because John um, would describe the wall house project as filling a hole in the project of Corbusier, that that's part of what an architect you know, does. It isn't just about, I don't know, original work, but to identify a trajectory of design uh, and to, you know, this, so it was, he called it hole filling. Um, shifting over to Nanako, uh, she was a student at Osaka University of Art, um, an urban planning major, and so the central group, um, uh, a student of Ian McCarg, she didn't have Ian McCarg, but she had a student of Ian McCarg, and it was more, uh, I guess the emphasis was on statistical planning. It was also, uh, in a way, analogous to the Gropius uh, models, pretty anti-design, more, you know, kind of, uh, uh, data gathering and, and mapping. Um, and Nanako's savior was uh, an architect who was a, um, a student of Antonine Raymond, Tsunetata Naito, on the one hand, and then Kinsato Nakane, who was a, a garden, um, mainly interested in landscape and garden. He was sort of the, the, the keeper and the kind of uh, considered a you know, national treasure. He, I met both of them. Nakane was not honestly delighted to meet me because I was a foreigner, I was a gaijin. He was kind of shocked that his best student was going out with a foreigner, but you know, it's really good. Um, so uh, I wanted to just talk briefly, I mean, this is a quick sort of um, description of the way in which, uh, you know, kind of aside from the discursive aspect of architectural design and the arguments made by architects, uh, there's another kind of substratum which deals much more directly with drawings and models. Uh, and so here uh, you see the initial structural geometry for Toyo Ito's Serpentine Pavilion by Cecil Bauman, which was really a kind of, kind of rotated series of structural bends and columns. Ito um, gets that diagram, deliberately kind of misreads it, basically colors in the gaps between, you know, the structural bents, makes them volumetric, and, you know, generates um, the serpentine, you know, from that very kind of smart misreading. And it's interesting, you know, that you then see the same diagram much later um, in Sufu Fujimoto's project, kind of monstrously enlarged, uh, but still clearly, uh, you know, kind of derivative of that, uh, and goes back to the structural model, uh, you know, for his uh, uh, tower proposal uh, in, in Taiwan. So, uh, our office, and this is, uh, again, um, I would say developed more retrospectively than any, you know, it was not uh, so intentional that these lines of, of development happened until we kind of did them. But looking back, um, there is a kind of a clear consistency of development of certain um, models and projects within the office that were more or less concurrent. So going back, the first one was the textual project. Um, I worked for Aldo Rossi twice, both as a student. This was the work I did in 1979 in the summer when I was just 21 years old. I was more or less a hand. Um, the drawing and the design had been done uh, at least seven years before. But Rossi's intent here was to create a folio. This was to be um, a version of Modena Cemetery for, for America. And so 
what he, uh, I mean, some of this is my speculation. I do, I do know that this was to be a folio for America, but that the only thing that really changed uh, was the color palette. And he took me deliberately, you know, from directly to the art supply store, started pulling out tubes of paint, um, which to me was completely anti-intruder. Um, I know the Peter Max kind of fluorescent greens, and then the strange um, uh, kind of pastel palette, which wasn't so much, I don't know, what you would see in FOMO, uh, but more what you would find in what they used to call restaurants for ladies, um, like the Birdcage restaurant in you know uh, New York. Anyway, it was a kind of mix, and of course he did you know have his signature red that didn't change, but it was mainly based on that. And he kind of signed both of our names on the drawing. Sylvia has this drawing at her show at the Canadian Center itself. Uh, she you know, got really fascinated with it. And then Nanako and I uh, collaborated for the first time on Rossi's um, Biennale in 85, which was, again, entirely based on kind of textual descriptions of sites in the Veneto. Uh, so the Villa Farsetti um, had a humanist garden. Uh, the original garden was based on a kind of miniaturization of Rome, among other things. And so we interpreted that more, I guess, along the lines of a Roman carnival kind of event structure, which moved from a, uh, a battle to a feast. And of course, the site was populated by humanoid elements drawn from Marcel Duchamp, uh, but also more kind of specifically designed um, elements, which were allegorical kind of machines, very much, you know, indebted to Haida. The next project uh, was a competition, but at the time, again, the, you know, the texts were all important. So um, it was Dalibor Vesely gave this project out for a house in Wiesbaden, Germany. So there was a straightforward program, and then there was um, the more esoteric program. He was you know, really interested in um, a Renaissance text called the Hypnorato Machia, right, kind of roughly translates as the stripe of love in a dream. We didn't want to, I don't know, go totally into some kind of interpretation of Renaissance text, so we uh, changed um, the name to the uh, Ero Machia Hypnia House, which is uh, the dream of a love of strife, and then uh, shifted to mid you know, early, mid 20th century Germany instead. So it was a kind of allegorical picture, picture text using collage and a, a volumetric model uh, based upon actually wax modeling. So it was collage, but also kind of would flip into rendering, I would say. It wasn't pure use of collage either. And then kind of parallel to that, more kind of purely textual experiments, this was a, a kind of maze-like um, rhizome structure, although I hadn't re yet read Deleuze, um, but just taking newspaper kind of fragments, creating short live narratives that had to kind of connect and reconnect in a very rigorous way. Manica was really disturbed by me doing it. I felt I, I would, she wouldn't want to, didn't want to be in the room when I was doing this because I had a feeling, a kind of strange, omnipotent feeling um, assembling these texts, <laughs> which, you know, it was kind of delirious. Um, and then uh, kind of parallel to that, uh, in the same project, the creation of these hieroglyphs from um, word, collages and word fragments kind of systematically applied to a magic square and then reapplied to the origin points. This was part of the Globe Theater project. So I was reading a lot of Francis Yates uh, and all of the esoteric origins of um, Shakespeare's Globe Theater according to you know, the laws of magic. Again, you know, very much interested in the kind of uh, the large glass and kind of working out, you know, problems relative to that, and also creating this strange 
Chess Lab. So there was a moment of crisis, I would say, um, which coincided with the economic downturn around 1991. It was the same time that Tom Main went bankrupt. Um, there was this issue of semi-text architecture, which was uh, guest edited by, I guess he lives here, Haraz Tanzaitlian. He's more of kind of a professional AIA type now. But he was, you know, very aggressive. He was able to convince, uh, you know, some quite serious um, philosophers and intellectuals to take this on. And he invited, uh, you know, arguably a very serious group of architects. I can't remember all of them, but you know, Liz Diller and and there was a generation interested in this area. Um, and I talked to people about five years after, and there was a consensus that this was like a total disaster. That this issue was like, it ended a period of work very definitively. There was a disgusting cover um, by, who was it, uh, Sanford's friend did that cover. Anyway, um, we knew we had to kind of do something else. Um, and so we were involved doing minor structures and landscape on my mother's project. So actually, it was quite extensive work. We had to blast the whole hillside and create a plateau and a swimming pool. I did all you know, the um, pergola structures and benches and you know, all of those king walls, spas. Um, deployable bridges, so a kind of a series of relatively small-scale structures, um, but we always use them, you know, to try to speculate on larger things. So from a fence post on the one hand uh, and on the left, all the way, you know, finally kind of synthesized a lot of the experiments in a competition. So. Small-scale experiments that get built, and then large-scale uh, ambitions that don't. Uh, that was very typical of the time. Competitions were really important to our generation. Uh, uh, you know, among colleagues at Columbia University, you know, like Greg Lynn and Stan Allen, and um, the whole group would would take on the same competition would typically not win the competition, but would you know, compare the work. And so I think that was a very important thing generationally. I don't know if that's still the case, but this was our, um, our proposal, a kind of uh, mutated shed typology um, that would kind of bring inside and outside together through the transformation and the branching of the uh, rehinged arch. And then, you know, um, confronting our competitors' work. And I have to say, we were really blown away by the FOA project. I mean, it was something that I think for our generation at that time was really groundbreaking. And so, of course, the immediate reaction was to get jealous. And in the next competition, we basically took on that, uh, you know, we, we could do it better, right? Um, so the Kansai Library was the next big international competition that we all entered. Um, and you know, we, we kind of worked along somewhat parallel paths. So I'm going to kind of jump forward for a moment. Um, it took me a long time to kind of make sense of what happened at the Surface Project and how our work fit into it. And we were invited to a roundtable discussion, actually Nanako was, um, on the occasion of the Japanese Constellation show uh, at MoMA. And the show, uh, although I think their ambitions were wider at the beginning, finally kind of boiled down to a kind of pyramid, very traditional pyramid, right, uh, of masters and then followers and kind of a generational cross-section. Um, I and Nanaka were kind of disturbed by it, just because it wasn't, it's not that it's not true, but it was just not complete. And so what we put together for the round table was a kind of genealogy of work that led 
to the surface projects that they were being shown, you know, at the Japanese constellation, starting with REMS, you know, sort of amazing insight about, you know, connecting Domino and a parking garage, uh, and having that, you know, kind of work as the operant principle of the Jesuit library, bringing, you know, the, the parking garage was a prototypical building where a street gets folded into a building, and then, you know, the kind of promenade down through the building, uh, you know, connected it organically, you know, with the street and with movement. Anyway, so I won't go into that too much, but then, you know, all of the followers of REM, you know, advancing that project, and Brett wrote a really interesting essay, which we have in the book, which talked about that moment. Um, and then um, this peculiar moment when FOA won the competition, they were collaborating with Cecil Bauman, um, who, you know, a part of, I guess I, I should say, that the ambition of that surface project was really contradictory, which made it a real architectural problem, right? I mean, that the, the surface had to be infinitely smooth, infinitely thin, had to connect to everything, but at the same time, you know, of necessity also had to end. There was finitude as well as continuity. There was almost the impossibility of structuring those very gently curving surfaces without, you know, additional structure. And so, um, from that ideality, you know, um, Bauman came up with this system derived from Le Ricolet, this sort of double um, cor directional corrugation. Ultimately, it actually was not workable. And when it came time actually to do the, uh, you know, the, the actual building, they approached Kunio Watanabe, who, uh, you know, came up with the idea of fusing those, you know, very thin surfaces with the folded plate. Uh, and so we, at, you know, when we got to the next competition, we're also interested in very similar issues. That kind of image down below is a picture of one of our wax models. Uh, we brought it to Israel Sinek, who is our structural a teacher at Cooper Union and with whom we worked uh, for many years. It was drooping like crazy. He said, you know, there's no way that kind of surface with such a low aspect ratio is going to self-support. And so he also uh, went to the folded plate, but instead of fusing folded plate to each, you know, level, uh, propose that we do superstructure the whole project, make a very strong kind of roof and then basically hang the slender uh, kind of undulating slabs under that superstructure roof. And so that initiated a whole line of work that kept going even past the surface project. And then, you know, the, the, the project, um, the finished Yokohama port terminal was seen by uh, Sasaki, the engineer. He was very unhappy with the fact slabs with the fused, um, uh, you know, fusing the folded plate to the slab. And so his project actually was a project of, you know, uh, kind of quantifying that problem and refining it. And so the problem didn't originate in Japan, but it was more or less as an abstract idea solved in Japan. But I would argue actually that the FOA project is more interesting architecturally than a lot of the, the pure kind of surface work. So the complication to me is interesting. And then our, you know, surface, our, our rod net project continued on for whatever, 17 or so years. We did all kinds of permutation of the hanging structure and the prop structure and, uh, and addressed many different scales of program. And so I use this actually as a kind of argument to my thesis students. Um, that you need a project in order to kind of address an architecture. You, it's not about, in a way, like a Gropius problem where you're sort of tabula rasa trying to kind of solve problems from, I don't know, site and program, but these kinds of models are the thing that reads the specifics of the site and the program. That's what, you know, 
So this is, you know, we, we, we very strongly you know, believe in that. So I just kind of demonstrate that the programs are completely different, the sites are completely different, uh, and where they are in, you know, are completely different. It's, you know, not unlike what Mies van der Rohe would do, although, you know, not that. So also the formal, you know, dimension of the work uh, is paramount in that regime, the kind of how, what the difference between modernism does with hierarchy, part the whole relationships, and so forth. And so, you know, it led to projects which didn't get there, but the, this was our, the house project, um, the Sagaponic House, and it resonates with the work of others. And so, um, I found this amazing um, quote uh, from Adorno, who I usually don't read, especially because I'm at Princeton and it's like the heart of critical theory land. But I was really struck uh, by Adorno's reading um, of the kind of a, uh, I mean, denunciation of form in relationship to the social, which was already a problem in 1930. I highlighted themes because Liz Diller is really interested in themes in the thesis, so. That's my criticism of Liz. That's my issue with her. That report, that. But anyway, um, there was um, a wonderful um, PowerPoint that Andy Zago put together, kind of making the distinction between the discipline of architecture and the profession. And so I'll just run through these really quickly. It's done so well, I figured it's better just to show it. So it's what architecture can bring uniquely to the discipline that you know, other forms can. And he also describes you know, the relationship and scale of, uh, uh, of the discipline relative to the scale of the profession. And then he found, uh, and then you know, the two different sort of examples of ways of working. But he also had a very pointed sort of critique of Jimmy Gang, which I thought was interesting to show, uh, where she um, did a piece of research on, I guess, bird strikes on buildings. And her argument for this was based upon um, the kind of performance of this, you know, it's a form of the Rodnet project. An early adapter version, um, but it's entirely based on, on the issue of the bird strikes. That's the reason uh, for the language, right? And then Andy, God bless him, um, looked and then realized that in fact, uh, you know, a much larger killer of, of, of birds are the common house cat. And so, yeah, he also used these very humanistic sketches to indicate you know, how you could drown house cats or <laughs> Anyway, so interesting description, yeah, sort of uh, <laughs> difference between the profession and the discipline in the way you can think. RUR is you know, also characterized by very important, you know, for us, collaborations. Israel Sinek was our professor of structures at the Cooper Union for four years. Um, was a very unique character, what my grandfather would call an anti-textbook engineer who really could do most of the calculations in his head um, very quick. He was also uh, from Cuba, and one of his main clients was Meyer Lansky. And he uh, was the engineer for some you know, really famous modernist hotels in Cuba. He also, in the, there, this is, yeah, you know, Hyman Roth, if you know The Godfather too, was based upon Meyer Lansky. He also was the engineer uh, for someone we all know, did the engineering of the Trump Tower and Taj Mahal, and was the engineer for our building. 
So this was more, you know, how we kind of worked. We, we had been working kind of alternatively with Arup and with Sinek. And I realized that in this project in Dubai, I needed a member of the Rat Pack. Sinek could sit there and deliver an argument about a building that was really speculative and make, you know, put everybody at ease. And so um, he was really the one, I think, who, uh, you know, kind of, in a sense, you know, convinced everybody that this was doable as a project. He also called this um, trickle-down um, structural design, because he's a Reagan uh, Republican. <laughs> um, OK, this is the musical instrument problem. I have to speed up, I think. It was assigned by John Haydock to the thesis students uh, at Cooper Union. John had no you know, very clear pedagogical intent, I would say, or at least it was never stated, just to draw the musical instruments. Um, I actually didn't do it, uh, but I saw other people's work, and I was just blown away. Um, actually, Stan was in the class, Stan Allen, through a triangle, which is very characteristic of Stan. <laughs> so there was a consistency and sensibility even from the beginning. Uh, but I was, of course, completely taken in by this, these amazing drawings and the kind of relationship between you know, the organic form of the musical instrument and its kind of relation with the mechanism. And so the first work that uh, you know, we attempted was more um, to make the drawing look as cool as that musical instrument. So this was a, a clock tower for the Venice uh, Biennale project, which is kind of an anamorphic uh, projection of the guts of a clock. Of course, it didn't work, but it looked cool. Um, and then, you know, these were, you know, more of those, you know, amazing kind of drawings uh, done at the beginning of the oboe and so forth. And it took yeah, but 35 years later, I should say, you know, none of the thesis students could actually bring that logic to bear on their design projects. They did phenomenal drawings, but it was just too much uh, for them to kind of digest and actually make it you know, kind of synthetic and projective. And I realized that we got something really close to the musical instrument drawing uh, by not drawing. And so these are all of the, um, this is all the HVAC and duct work that had to negotiate through the um, port terminal. And so the logic of the branching systems and the kind of heat we put on those systems yielded organizations, you know, like the musical instrument. We finally kind of were, you know, happy with that, although we actually didn't do it. So, oh, we'll go to Nanako now. Yeah. Um. Nanika will do a more straightforward presentation. Of, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the, we are going to show two uh, uh, projects we are building now in Taiwan. And then uh, I am presenting Kaohsiung Port Terminal. And uh, Kaohsiung is the uh, most southern part of uh, Taiwan. Some of them came from that city. I don't remember. One of the that one. Yes. So um, our project uh, is including port terminal, uh, office tower for port authority, and the public space like park and restaurant. And it celebrates uh, the crossing between land and water. Uh, tri robes architecture presents three different uh, directions international and the domestic departure and as well as arrival. Yeah. Uh, the long view from the harbor explore uh, the iconic possibility of the building. And the vessel type is um, world cruise is coming and also international cruise and the fast ferries 
international fast ferry and the domestic ferries. Um, this uh, slide shows the uh, Taiwan uh, location with uh, Japan and China and Korea and some red area is Soviet Union. Russia. Russia. <laughs> okay. So our schematic concept uh, brings together all the necessary uses uh, uses that we created sandwich uh, of the program with a terminal use in the middle and then public above and then service below. So uh, this shows the how 3D urbanism uh, works in our buildings. Uh, lower floor is ground, ground service and passenger, and middle is passenger, and uh, the high level, high high level is public boardwalk and office office towers. So this slide shows the Kaohsiung Port Terminal is the connecting to the city uh, pedestrian walk and the part of the continued, continuous uh, waterfront public uh, walkway that uh, connect pop music center, which we didn't design, and then shopping district. The Port Terminal uh, view from the street, and then this uh, uh, this called tri rope form. The form can be used inward and outward, and it can be optimized with uh, different programs. A uh, tri rope from form are applied with different programs. And the lobby space is not the typical uh, column field for, for our case, um, uh, but uh, channeling space direct, directed towards the uh, gate. The zone of overlap with public are the perfect place for events because they are sheltered. Uh, this is the uh, 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 the view of main lobby. Uh, one can see the domestic and international departure hall and office, uh, other amenities simultaneously. And then the view view from lobby into open uh, space. Uh, Prospective space. This, this is we start building now here, yeah. and then the next one is a section of the lobby through the lobby of the port terminal, and then uh, we see public program and the port terminal program equally important in the project because transportation program. We make a uh, public boardwalk, a uh, shops, restaurant accessible to both travelers and also local residents. And we, we <coughs> hope that, that this building activates the uh, um, old uh, port, uh, industrial port. port. This simplified, <coughs> this simplified section um, shows that for the departing passenger, stay on one level, and also they can see the function of the uh, uh, boardwalk. <coughs> so if they have a time, they can join the uh, uh, boardwalk uh, amenity. Uh, the main level, second floor, 
allow uh, direct access to the level to the uh, waiting area and the boarding gate. Uh, branching from one central space to each functional row. Uh, this is the plan, uh, plan of rooftop. And the next one is a view of the International Departure Lounge, uh, boardwalk, and log A from the second floor of uh, co uh, the uh, uh, courtyard. This is the uh, built form of the view of landscape courtyard and center of the project. Uh, the third floor of the terminal intersects the public waterfront boardwalk to create commercial and the public zone. The restaurants and shops inside directly connected to the boardwalk. Visitor can see the departure hall below. These are <coughs> these staircase and elevator towers in between the low wall in crochet. So that this makes the main lobe space clean and also same time control the security for the boarding areas. View of the public boardwalk and view of the public boardwalk in construction. And this Uh, this site uh, went through the uh, um, remediation of the saturated oil in the ground. This was a really polluted area, and the cleaning this site took them like uh, two years. Well, this was originally in the 30s, the kind of tank farm for the Imperial Japanese Navy. And so it was bombed first by the United States, rebuilt as a tank farm after the war, so there's a lot of uh, you know, petroleum like soup under the ground that had to be cleaned uh, over the years. So quite a kind of material history. So, so uh, but you see this Kaohsiung Ka port terminal from the high tallest tower of the Kaohsiung. Uh, this is one of the columns. And then uh, this shows the uh, structure of the uh, tower of the uh, Kaohsiung Port Terminal. It's worth noting also that the design, the structural design by Sinek, uh, was fundamentally unchanged over the whole 10 years, whereas Taipei Pao was radically changed. So the, this is the uh, Kaohsiung Port Terminal from the waterfront. And then uh, the Kaohsiung Port Terminal is sitting on the decking. And then one of the uh, uh, one of the uh, robe is looking out the ocean. So the Iowa Port Terminal project combines a new public uh, espionage running continuously above the industrial water from with iconic architecture that is active from year and a half. Yeah. Now. I mean, the thing that, of course, happens is we were asked to provide, you know, as part of the competition, an urban master plan. But in reality, of course, what they actually could build at the time was this segment. But ideally, um, you know, that that elevated esplanade would, con will, I think it will, continue, you know, all along the edge. And so it will kind of move from being much more kind of object-oriented, contained building to, well, the building will still be an object, but it will sit on, you know, a, a much larger um, structure that kind of rises above the industrial waterfront and the program for the general public. Okay. I, I, I will um, describe um, Taipei Pop Music Center. Um, 
as I mentioned before, it was really 10 years in gestation before it was even let out in competition. But the ambition was to create um, a new area in Taipei that was devoted to the, you know, pr the production and the performance uh, you know, of uh, music. It actually changed from being the pop music center to the music center quite recently uh, because I think they wanted to make address music uh, in general. And so you can see uh, the three kind of major um, elements kind of sitting above the horizon. Um, the left is the industry shelf for kind of recording and to cut off. Then the cube um, is a hall of fame and museum and archive. And then there's a 5,000 seat uh, main hall. What you won't don't see, or I'll show later, is a very large, uh, uh, a, a 2,000 um, not seat, but a kind of standing space for outdoor uh, performance as well. So it's um, in an area that uh, kind of moving from being a, kind of an industrial area next to the rail yards uh, in Taipei. Uh, between kind of Mangang and Kunyang uh, Station. There were paint factories and other kind of kinds of industrial buildings. And yeah, as the ambition was really to create a new uh, you know, kind of 24-hour uh, neighborhood uh, in that zone, like bringing residential uh, development uh, around um, this pop music area. And also from the outset, uh, you know, the whole uh, question of the iconic building, you know, was very much in the fore, uh, mainly because, you know, it was assumed that a lot of people would actually never go to the site, but that they should immediately recognize this site as being uh, uh, kind of representing uh, pop music in Taiwan. Um, Taiwan's pop music industry was one of the earliest, I think, after Japan. But of course, with the rise of, kind of mainland China's pop music industry and K-pop, they felt the necessity really to create a new zone to bring all the producers, certainly the ones who are in Taipei, into one area and to give identity to you know, the um, industry through architecture. The other demand, though, uh, which we took very seriously was uh, that it also had to be a viable piece of urbanism. In other words, uh, you know, that it would be integrated into the everyday life of the city when there weren't performances. And so, uh, we, you know, we made a very uh, kind of, uh, I think, important decision not to consolidate um, all of the functions on one site into a kind of massive pile uh, which many of our competitors did, but rather to spread out the project over you know these two sites, and it was kind of difficult in that way because there was a very long, narrow site, and then uh, kind of a, a square site connected across a main road by these typical bridges in Taiwan. And we also went through the exercise of how you know the. Um, this area would be used over time, uh, you know, proposing possible schedules. This is in the competition phase, uh, you know, for markets and performance and you know, staging of those things. And so, this is a, a more um, recent uh, version. This is the built version of the kind of programmatic distribution. So you have, uh, you know, a number of live houses clubs kind of uh, adjoining this big central plaza, kind of um, circus-like plaza, the 5,000 seat hall, and then the industry shell uh, at the bottom where they produce music, and then the hall of fame and exhibition and so forth, research area in the cube. So there was a kind of idea of a groundwork, a ground fabric, and then this elevated horizon at the height of the bridge um, upon which these object buildings are perched. 
so you could see those buildings from any point in the complex, they would be visible. And then surrounding that long site, a, a, a public park. So this is a view, you know, during one of the uh, open um, outdoor performances, looking towards the industry cell. Um, and this is more kind of shopping uh, mode. But the area can be closed off and controlled and become a ticketed area uh, you know, when it's not open to the general public. And so, yeah, to compare it morphologically, this is a uh, Limoges concert hall, almost exactly the same program by Bernard Schumi. Uh, and it kind of results in, you know, kind of this round, kind of very vertical building. And because of the sort of elevated horizon um, and the bridge, we decided to really create, uh, you know, based on the, the kind of bridge level, to create a, a more lateral building, to kind of work against the verticality of the typical concert hall. And so our building is really kind of split between a groundwork, this is the main hall, a groundwork which has most of the sort of functional elements like, you know, the um, loading and unloading docks kind of uh, protected by an elevated kind of artificial hill. And then um, the theater um, uh, actually rests on that, but also goes down in section uh, into the hill. So uh, the general public can move from the uh, open to the uh, public concerts across the way and can enter high uh, and in, on the low end. They can also enter at, enter at grade and also at grade they have all of the kind of red carpet events. So we were looking at these you know, traditional morphologies like the stupa uh, or the um, Kind of development you, know, you see uh, there's an image from Ram and Kurosawa is Ram was kind of um, exploration of the silhouette was really uh, important to us, how it kind of looks against the sky. This is what we call the more you know, the mothership in but the, the entry for all of the services are happening just beyond that hill. And then the building itself is more of a kind of nested series of spaces. So the bridge um, that crosses the street becomes coextensive with all the mezzanines and all of the kind of levels that feed different levels in the concert, in the performance hall. And yeah, then the facade sort of you know, comes over that. There are also parking levels below the it's a fairly complex section. This is a view of uh, sort of split between the fly tower on the right, the performance hall uh, without this kind of lower seating installed yet, and then above the uh, lighting grid, all the technical grid. And again, you know, this is the sort of junction between the bridge and the facade, uh, you know, going into the building, in the lobby early development. Here you get more of a sense of a kind of surface-like space. We were also interested, um, in a way, uh, with the kind of, kind of common materials, the corrugated materials, but it didn't want uh, simply to reference common materials. And so, uh, kind of drawing on my knowledge of aircraft, um, this is the more the kind of decking level. You can see how it moves. We were interested in you know doing something with the color of the skin, and so um, I was looking at this kind of old-fashioned um, anod anodic process that used characteristically in Japan for you know unprepossessing things like teapots and uh, sake cups called the uh, alumite. And they also use that color um, uh, on certain aircraft. And, and there was a theory about how it could blend in with the sky and the water. So 
you know, I was really fascinated with how we could kind of use that uh, as a color for the skin. And then there also these amazing uh, work done in Germany in the 30s with corrugated material, like producing micro corrugations to make sharp corners. So they corrugate and corrugate again. So highly crafted um, ways of bringing together corrugated or ribbed materials with batten strips or uh, you know, various kinds of details were really fascinating. And so, you know, that also kind of led to the way we developed uh, the facade work. There's a lot of experimentation, too, because some of the curvature that you see here had to be rolled, and Foreman had one idea about how to deal with the curvature, and others would just say, no, we can just push some of this stuff into place, and you'll get subtle curves. You don't need to roll them. But it was a lot of experiments with that. Also, you know, how to reconcile curvilinear frames with um, crystalline patterns, and I think went to the uh, Battle of Grit and Goggles. <laughs> and also, yeah, kind of developing this uh, kind of, um, cantilevering figured uh, roof. All of the steel work here was. Um, redone, actually, by a local engineering firm. And in retrospect, we should have started with them at the beginning, because most of the steelwork was actually covered up. Uh, but we're still paying Hong Kong Arab uh, for a steel design that isn't being used. So you live and learn. The, 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 the building culture is really important. I think that's something that we can really learn there, that even if they you know, company is based in a place like Hong Kong, there's an entirely different ways and kind of means and methods and even steel sections that are used from one country to another. What sort of is typical? Anyway, it kind of shows from rendering to structure. And this is Monaco up on the roof <laughs> of the cube. And then we're kind of negotiating this um, boundary wall with a stair that kind of weaves in and out that has the history of, of music in it. And I guess this is my last little argument, um, where actually Axel Killian, who was a colleague, um, confronted me where the, you know, why our proposal in the first phase of um, Taipei Pop looked so similar to the Kaohsiun Port Terminal. And Nanako touched on this earlier. But basically, the, you know, we'd been working on this sort of trilobe thing, even, you know, from a very old competition. Of course, we were looking at Melnikov's theater in, in Moscow. Um, but I realized, you know, that all of the, you know, like, lines of sight, uh, and paths of movement could easily be kind of flipped around. And you would basically, it's a manifold that could work either way. And so um, this was sort of the, the insight, you know, or, or my kind of defense on dealing with um, a very kind of unique form and how it could be applied to what are apparently completely different programs. And of course, you know, it's never questioned in a grid-based building. But it's definitely, you know, something that you know raises question marks, uh, you know, with a highly specific kind of formal language. Anyway, this is the kind of last diagram. We were in the history of the project. Um, Rossi's argument about urban morphology over time, uh, you know, was really fascinating to me. That it took 1,500 years for the Circus Agonalis in Rome to become the Piazza Navona, you still get the uh, kind of trace you know, going from a pure kind of performance space uh, to a, a piazza with, with stores around it. And so uh, our argument was that at Taipei Pop, it actually had to be done in 24 hours, the shift. And then notionally, kind of moving from a stadium which is closed and has a single focus, a, a, a circus obviously is a stretched 
stadium. And in our first scheme, we basically cut the circus and then branched it to connect across the road. In the second phase, because we ran into you know, incredible resistance and also the robot theater uh, that we had proposed was incredibly costly, we went back in a way to a, a more kind of recognizable circus form. But it was part of a continuum. And there are sort of parallels that I won't get into because it's going too long uh, in, in, the, uh, in other projects dealing with uh, kind of layered urbanism that we had explored uh, in New York were applied to the Kaushum project. The kind of development, the kind of uh, design of multiple grounds, which is inherent actually in Manhattan. And also the kind of bringing together of an object, I don't want to say oriented, but an object or, or architecture with the surface architecture was not a contradiction. I will end with this construction time lapse. Thank you. Take questions. Thank you so much for this uh, very uh, inspiring lecture. Um, having studied with Greg Lynn 15 years ago, uh -huh. I have followed your work really closely back mm -hmm. then at the Angewandte. And seeing now you talking about the project, uh, was very exciting mm -hmm. to kind of reframe some of your connections between the projects. So thank you for that. Um, I have a question which relates more uh, to, because you also in the last video showed the construction building site and how important, like mm -hmm. you always switch between the different views of the rendering and the construction mm -hmm. site. Um, the design language, um, obviously, it took several years to kind of from the competition to the building construction. Mm -hmm. And during the time of the design process, um, you, in, in those series of study models, you didn't necessarily have a building material or construction method maybe in mind at mm -hmm. the first place. And so I, wa I was wondering how after you now construct the building, mm -hmm. if you were to go back to design a building again with this kind of idea of designing something and then kind of figuring out what material you're going to use, which this kind of goes mm -hmm. back to the generation of, well, we design something and then we're going to figure it mm -hmm. out how to build it. So what kind of um, standpoint do you have now towards that methodology and I think that would be really interesting for the students especially because we have conversations uh -huh. in the building construction class about that yeah like how you how you how your own opinion towards that has changed uh, uh -huh. over the last 15 years that's a good question um, I mean certainly with the structural design um, both of Kaohsiung and Taipei, those were, you know, we collaborated with the engineers from the get-go. So um, the question of, you know, the structure being steel was something that was arrived at, you know, fairly early on in, in, in both projects. Um, yeah, uh, you know, Taipei Pop radically changed, had to restart it over actually, because the client changed from the government to the industry. And so they um, increased the program, you know, for the main hall from 3,000 
to 5,000. They didn't like having the audience broken up into those lobes. They wanted everybody to be in a common space. So there were programmatic requirements that affected um, the design. But in answer to your kind of question about the, the materials, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess, the, you know, issues of like, uh, uh, of the envelope changed a lot. You know, choices of, you know, what to do with the envelope. I remember talking to Hitoshi and him recommending that we think seriously about a stone, stone cladding um, for Kaosho because it was, too, at that time, especially too similar to uh, uh, Taipei Pop. But that was sort of taken care of by itself. <laughs> well, I would like also that we had we worked with local architects, and then they told us that in Taiwan they uh, somehow concrete doesn't come come out well, and then so that the typical material is uh, steel, and then when you go to um, Dubai, they, they only use concrete. They don't use steel. Yeah, there was so a, it's yeah. depend on only the, in very special cases. Do they, yeah. Yeah. It's not that, yeah. But I don't know if I'm answering your question really. But uh, like, if you were to redesign the building now or another project, uh -huh. and you would know that you would already work with steel or with the stone facade beforehand, would that kind of have an influence of the design language? Oh, sure, sure. I think, you know, and also certainly, you know, to work more closely with the local building culture, um, just because of, yeah, it's kind of having to have everything redesigned yet again to, you know, the other part of it was in Taiwan, I think that the, the role of the architect is very different. The architect is also as much an architect as a construction manager. And so they have, uh, in both projects, the local architect, uh, Fei and Cheng, have big teams on the site. And they're also very, they're, they're open to much more liability than American architects. And they can be jailed you know, for problems. And we, yeah, I mean, we also, uh, you know, the contracts are, from the point of view of American architecture, onerous. We were told by our lawyer not to sign either contract. Of course, we didn't. But, yeah. Um, Hello. Uh, thank you for what a wonderful talk. Uh, it was really insult. As you guys were talking, I had two thoughts uh, on my mind, uh, two unrelated thoughts. Uh, one was, once I began to see Teatro Olimpico in almost every diagram, uh, I can't hmm. really unsee it. Um, and the way that, you know, let's say Teatro Olimpico reverses, let's say the inside-outside relationship, or front and back, or the concealed-revealed relationship. Mm -hmm. It's almost a reversible diagram. Uh, mm -hmm. Every time you do this kind of, you know, uh, destination circulation, it's almost as though the circulation in itself is the destination in every go. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's one thought that uh, uh -huh. was emerging in my head as I uh, was listening. The other was, um, <clears throat> you know, I've always been fascinated by the uh, paperless years. Uh, paperless studio, which you know, mm -hmm. Jason was, a, uh, uh, Marcelo also, you know, many people were students of that period. And uh, when I think about uh, some of the earlier work uh, of the office, mm -hmm. uh, you know, let's say the collage project uh, in mm -hmm. early digital is a is is an engagement with the raster. Whereas you know, if we were to be thinking about the Poisson studies or maybe even the Statue of Liberty. Uh, maybe even uh, your fascination with uh, Darcy Thompson, these are mm -hmm. vector studies rather than mm -hmm. raster studies. Uh, and I, I wonder, you know, because the, the more recent work that, mm -hmm. uh, that you've been, you, the two of you have been conducting uh, are largely mm -hmm. vector. I think the raster work has gone away. And I wonder whether or not uh, that's an accurate read. Um, I don't think so. I mean, actually, we, we never were really so purely computational in that sense. Um, from the beginning, we were, you know, mixing it up 
with physical modeling. There were actually Jason Payne was uh, directly involved in this whole kind of problem with uh, what was it Maya emulations of the, the there was that um, the theater uh, Graz Music Theater with the catenaries. <laughs> no, I mean, there was a really interesting kind of moment where, um, you know, Maya would, you would be able to do a kind of a rough emulation of forces on geometry. Sinek, who was there, you know, um, advising us on the project, said, well, it's sort of still an emulation and it would be really important to kind of try to explore in an analog model a la Gaudi, but Gaudi on, I don't know, multi-dimensional Gaudi, um, but on LSD and who knows what. Yeah, but, you know, he was on his back for weeks kind of producing these kind of chain models that would go into probably strictly weren't all intention, but there were zones that would go into bending and um, and we were really fascinated with that. So there was another sort of strain, I think, at Columbia. I mean, it was the propaganda about the paperless studio that um, Bernard was very, you know, uh, eager to promote. And I think Greg, actually, and Hanny uh, were more orthodoxly involved in it. But then we and then Stan Allen were mixing things up. We were not ever really you know, purists in that way or celebrating programs. It was really a battle, actually, because we knew, we knew what we wanted, and then there was the inertia of the program that uh, kind of worked against it. And so I guess you would either argue that you would celebrate that, which we couldn't tolerate, or, you know, um, find ways of cobbling together various techniques to get, you know, what we were after. So it was never, I don't know, really vector-based or faster. And it also went from physical collage making, you know, with number 11 blades, took you know, three months to do the German house, and then always, you know, sitting by, actually, because we weren't doing most of the modeling or the drawing. And I make that really clear, actually, in the book. Um, that was your generation in the office too, who really had the ability. So we were, you know, doing analog stuff and designing with wax models and then it would go over to David Rue or to Jason um, to do that drafting. And modeling, not just drafting. Yes. Seeing that Ian McHarg was part of the yes. cosmos, you can Nanako was, can was, attest was, to that. Was it super illuminating uh -huh. that there was that there's a the, the, the father of mapping, yes, of, of ecology, yes, um, of, of information and mm -hmm. flows. It makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Buildings invariably next to water. Dealing with water, right. dealing with networks, uh -huh. um, fascinating um, view sheds, watersheds, mm -hmm. and so to the question the, to the question about what it's made of, mm -hmm. um, sheds or ducts or view sheds. Mm -hmm. It seems it seems like there's a a duck instinct. In the in the Venturian sense, that ends up getting resolved. Oh, duck, yeah, not duck, duck. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but we we end up with viewfinders, with view corridors, with things that are, you know, fifty fifty split between something to be looked at and something to be looked through. out right. through. Yeah, and um, and so. Thanks for the thanks for the genealogy. It's more it's it's okay. more of an observation than a <laughs> question. Uh -huh. But um, shed or duck, I guess, would mm -hmm. be the question. Hmm. 
or something in between? Well, never duck. I don't know. I never. <laughs> but but you're also never. Sh I mean, I think in yeah. in, in in the discipline, yes. we do not think of you as shed makers mm -hmm. at all. So. Uh, yeah, I have, I have a question. Thank you both yeah. for that great talk. Um, I was also really interested in the genealogy and the way that maybe there's a shift from the beginning of the genealogy, which is a little bit more chronological and maybe traditional in that sense, mm -hmm. toward the later diagrams of genealogy, which seem to be more achronological and have maybe mm -hmm. temporal gaps and things seem to resurface mm -hmm. more. Um, and also another shift might be that some things might be pulled more from your work uh, than, let's say, from outside. So if earlier you give these examples of the competitions everyone was doing in the 90s, um, mm -hmm. looking at each other's work and very explicitly borrowing. Um, something like Kaohsiung seems to be based more off your Cardiff mm -hmm. opera competition than anything else. And so, but, but there was maybe a gap in the middle where we were looking more at FOA and other people who were doing this sort of landscape projects. Right. And so I'm, I'm curious if maybe this is just the fact of having 40 years of practice uh -huh. to pull from right. if the kind of material for geology now, A, comes more from your own work and the sort mm -hmm. of dead ends or mm -hmm. ends that you've produced before and then resurfaced, uh, and also if there's sort of less of a chronology to the way that it's working now, the way that you're working. Uh, well, I mean, I think one of the things about the Kaohsiung project was that we started to see you know, non-contradictions. You know, like I guess there would be a genealogy which would be more Kind of interested in the object of the building, and then the, um, the surface project was in a way almost an anti-object model, uh, but that the two models actually work together really well. Or on a much smaller scale, I mean, this was more a sensibility kind of problem, like the purity of the Rodnet project, like uh, on the house on the Sagaponic house, I found it intolerable to, uh, there was no way to turn the corner. And so we then installed a more or less a Mesian corner, which um, in a way was decorative. Um, it didn't, have, didn't do the job of structuring, but I started to reconcile that too, that probably musically it's not a problem. It's not a matter of having a pure theory. But it would be, you know, that those other, um, the rod nets were gradients, were transitional, atmospheric, and then the corner was like a full stop. And I think a musician would use both. Wouldn't be seen as a, you know, impure or mistake. You would, those were just part of the repertoire of, um, so the, I think there was also a kind of, to me, an interesting, I, I, I think, development. I, I felt guilty when, when we first put in that corner. And then I started to realize that it's not a problem at all. Uh, it's just a matter of, you know, I don't know being narrowly consistent. <laughs> yes? This kind of returns to uh, Julia's Yulia's question a little bit, but takes it somewhere else. Um, one of the things that kind of resonates with me being a, a person trained in a transitional moment between kind of analog yeah. methods of production and digital methods of production is the way in which the kind of role of the, archi of the scale model in, mm -hmm. in your work and uh, the, I think the, I think Yulia's question um, kind of went directly to construction assembly, but but it seems to me that the way in which tectonics is part of the early production of your forms is through the instrument of the model of mm -hmm. the kind of physical model, and the 
uh, way in which it produces a kind of empirical understanding of right. tectonic behavior. Right. And so the transition, the sort of easy slippage between form found conditions that are rendered in sheets versus mm -hmm. rendered with vectors mm -hmm. is like an easy sleight of hand to make because mm -hmm. there's still efficiencies in both right. translations. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so when I was looking at the work, I was wondering about uh, places where the uh, form begins to lose its identification with like angles, structural systems, where you can't see a folded plate, right. versus projects where the surface is kind of takes the disposition of a mm -hmm. form of tectonic efficiency. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if that's something that you kind of actively uh, manage in the production of projects, like the suppression of tectonic, uh -huh. uh, tectonic, what's the word I want to look for, sort of tectonic principles mm -hmm. versus their kind of cloaking and, and hiding inside other pochets and surfaces. Like, is that something uh, that you think about? Yeah, I mean, I think it's something that we sort of um, we work with. It seems like it's a primary Yeah, we um, work with that. Material. Yeah, but um, probably never, yeah, never thought about it that way, but in fact, that's, you know, kind of part of an active way of uh, working back and forth. And whether the yeah the, the tectonic reinforces the form or goes against the form, I think there would be an interesting in mm -hmm. that. For the I have to. I have to yes. work on that. Now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Anico. Thanks, Jesse, for coming here. Pleasure doing all yeah. this. <clears throat> um, my question um, is um, has to do with the passing. Observe or comment you made, and but I've heard you make it before, so I don't think it's so passing about John Haydick and mm -hmm. um, the the idea that um, I, I don't want to um, what misstate what you said. So if I state this too strongly, just say so. But um, that there may have been uh, no pedagogy somehow that the pedagogy, let's just put it this way, was um, mostly invisible to the degree that it was there at all, something like this. And I'm, my question is, I m remember the first time I heard you observe this, mm -hmm. which was never negative or positive, it was just a statement, um, th that I was shocked and I was dismayed. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, I had been taught that he was one of the great pedagogues in architecture of school history, yeah. which, he, which of course he, 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 he surely was. Um, uh, but I'm wondering, so what, it, it, what was going on? I mean, would you mind expanding on that? Oh because surely there was not nothing nothing going on. There was there was, there was but well, I, I just I guess I want to understand. I think there were if different the pedagogy modes, is honestly, not so clear. I mean, what know, is it? When he taught first year <clears throat> students, there was a very sort of prescriptive and you know pedagogy you know, on the nine square grid and. Uh, you know, ways, uh, I guess, learning how to uh, compose, really, in three dimensions, I think, was the, was the aim of that. But then, um, once it got to more speculative material that he was interested in, um, it was much less that way. So when he taught the cutouts class, or when he was giving assignments to the thesis group, he wasn't really sure what he was going to get. It was more kind of an intuition of, uh, you know. But I mean, there would also be ways of tracking back to more, um, you know, that it was another kind of meco mechanical purism. I mean, that the, the musical instruments would be, or, you know, bottles, or even later on fruit, would be the elements that would come out of, you know, cubist and then purist painting. So there is a way of tracking back, you know, to that source material. But he would also go way off, you know. I mean, so during the review for the musical instrument problem, I remember him getting, you know, um, 
Bob Slutsky furious because he basically moved off the discussion totally about the musical instrument and just became fixated on the eyes of the, um, there was a wind-up monkey that would beat a drum. And so this one of the students was playing games and, you know, so it wasn't strictly a musical instrument. But, it, so, but then, you know, Hayduck just like, went right into the uh, kind of presence of the eyes, completely, you know, left to the discussion. Uh, but, you know, it was also an area that he was interested in. You know, it was more about a kind of animism, <laughs> which was part of his animal you know, obsession. But I don't know. I mean, it, it was interesting because it was never, you know, especially for the thesis group, it was never, um, ever spelled out. He wanted to see something, and I think that was also part of how we learned. I mean, it was more um, that you had to do the work in order to, you know, that the work would do something, it would tell you something. It was not something predetermined. And so you had some, you know, working pre, you know, suppositions. It wasn't completely vague, but at the same time, you were, you know, hopefully kind of receptive enough to let the work tell you something. Otherwise, you know, just Peter Cook would say that, right? Otherwise, why do it, right? I have a question about, um, like, in 1988, when you did the project for, like, Hyp Hypnos and Mafia, the, the 1998 house project, that was, like, a very uh -huh. critical moment. Yes. Um, I have a question about how that sort of translated into the sort of work that you just showed. Uh -huh. um, and sort of like where the criticism ends up when these projects become like sort of more visible in the professional world. Uh -huh. so that's my question. Hard to answer, although I would say that, I mean, one thing that I would, uh, Catherine Ingram brought this up in our presentation is that, uh, you know, like the hard break that's indicated with the end of the textual project is not exactly correct. I mean, that there are sort of different lifespans for different techniques. So the wax model making, you know, uh, the volumetric um, sort of models continued from Cranbrook all the way to the present. Um, whereas, you know, various techniques like the collage or the collage rendering had a different lifespan and then the textual, literal textual work had a, you know, an even shorter lifespan, so they sort of overlap um, and have different sort of eight times, you know, that cross the work. So it's like but I don't know if I'm answering your question either, but... Um, I think so. I think it's like in forms of making that were explored in those textual projects, they still kind of survive. Right. And I mean, the thing that, uh, you know, Bob Somo was furious at us because he wanted us to do a collage project. And so he literally felt betrayed and wouldn't talk to us for 15 years because I said that, you know, actually, Bob, you can't really use collage to design the whole project. And so we actually had a technique for designing a volumetric, you know, the volumetric model, and then you would apply collage to the volumetric model. You wouldn't use collage to do the whole thing. So, but you know, I guess there was a kind of ideological purity that Bob wanted to have, that you could do everything. And I remember Ben Nicholson trying uh, to do that and it didn't work. I mean, it was sort of, a, yeah, problems, um, you know, using only that technique. Yeah. This actually leads into what I was, the question I had. Um, when I see the diagram that Andy Zago made, uh, mm -hmm. quite literally presented, um, I, I, I don't exactly know how to interpret that because I, to, to my understanding, it was a form to establish a territory, though, though permeable, about the communication uh, amongst architects and the discipline, right? Uh, but a territory nonetheless. And so, what what is outside of that territory and the language and communication, uh, HVAC systems, structural systems, is 
is left out, I, I would say, on, on that side of my intention. But uh, there was a contradiction in the presentation and, 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 and almost a need to present that. And so uh, I, I don't say that as a criticism. Uh, I just wonder if, if, it's, if it is necessary. Well, I think it probably, to me, I probably look at it in a more kind of Nietzschean way. <laughs> I don't know where it's like, these are all forces that work and push on your project. Like the HVAC might be a dominating grid in the normative practice or have become normalized and then get, I don't know, correlated and meshed in the cheapest way with the structural system and produces what you see, but then if you're putting a lot of pressure on, say, uh, I don't know, the formal dimension of the project, which is non-normative, um, then it has, uh, you know, kind of surprising <laughs> effects on um, what would have been much more, I don't know, branching grid-based systems in normative building. So it's like, it's not so much contradictory, but like, um, where the, uh, what is it kind of exerting greater force in the project? <laughs>